but you cannot improve what you cannot measure. So make sure that whatever you want people to do from a behavior perspective, you can measure that and report on it and hold people accountable against it. The bigger you make your base pay, people get comfortable. The majority of the people in this country are what? Lazy and not curious. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA-accredited family business advisor, and a business owner with myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. My guests come onto the show to authentically share the highs and lows of creating a successful business and how they turn things around in their business to create a better business and better life. Or as in today's show, they're also experts who specialize in working with businesses. So today's guest, he has worked in sales his entire life. He started selling mainframes for IBM way back in the day. He was born in New Zealand, in Tokoro to be exact, but was raised in the Netherlands and he returned at the age of 26 where he met and married a Kiwi. And they have twin boys, which he says is double the fun. Today he's going to share with you the four key pillars of high-performing sales and marketing functions. Andrew Cedar is the co-founder and director of Fresh Perspective Sales. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. Yeah. Now, I didn't actually mention it in the intro, but we actually met because we were both executives and residents at the Ice House. And that was how many years ago now? Oh, too long to too remember. Long. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. But it shows we've got the scars. We've got, we've the, got the, 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 the gray hair and all that kind of you stuff too, yeah, which is great. But we actually reconnected us recently. And as soon as we reconnected, I thought, I've got to have Andrew on the show. I really want to hear a little bit about what he's been up to. And I know that you have some amazing tools and things you can share for people in business. Totally. So before we get started, tell us a bit about your story. Tell us how you got to where you are today. I'd love to. Look, like we discussed before, and like you mentioned, I used to work for IBM in the Netherlands in this case, selling mainframes, big, large, TSD, et cetera, in the good old days. And uh, IBM uh, offered me a year off, sabbatical year, after I did my MBA, which they paid for. So I said, why not? Well, unpaid leave. Where can I go? With my Dutch girlfriend at the time, we said, let's go to New Zealand. Went to New Zealand, knocked on IBM's head office door in, in the terrace in Wellington in those days. I'm talking late 80, 1989. And within four weeks, I had a job offer from IBM in Wellington. So I joined them. And four and a half years later, after they moved me up to Auckland, a computer knocked on the door and said, would you like to come and work for us? We have this particular vacancy or, or the vision that we need to have somebody to look after. And would you want to do that? So sure, I did. Was with Compaq for 10 years. and then. The good old Euler Packard came knocking on the door and they acquired Compaq. Long story short, uh, I just become father of the twin boys that you referred to before, Ivor and Luca, and decided, no, this is not me. I'll take a check. So I took redundancy at that time of that uh, merger. And uh, HP kept knocking on my door. They said, when are you coming back? I said, well, why should I? Well, 18 months later, I was back at HP for another four and a half years. And then when those four and a half years were over, I actually got sick and tired of working for a large corporate. Wall Street driven, short term thinking, no long term planning, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, New Zealand is a rounding era in terms of the total business of a multinational. So, look, decided to leave. And at the time, I was working with my current co founder and other director, Greg Noons, and we decided to set up Fresh Perspective Sales to help businesses get better at what they should be good at revenue generating through either marketing and sales. And we've been doing this now for about 15 years. So that's in a, in a brief summary. So I'm really fascinated going from a very large corporate, let's face it, HP is massive. And like you said, New Zealand's a rounding era. What was it like going from that to actually starting up your own business? I've always come from an entrepreneurial background. My father always has, 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 many, has had many businesses back in the Netherlands. Even in New Zealand, he was self-employed. My wife has two businesses. So I came from that entrepreneurial background. But the point is that in this country, a lot of businesses, as you probably know, and we saw that through the eye cells as well, they get to a certain stage and they plateau and they don't know how to scale from that initial startup, so to speak. And look, having worked now in these large corporates, you know, we, know what it, we both know what it takes to scale a business. What are the fundamental foundational elements that you have to put in place in order to scale a business? And that's what we then bring to the table to a lot of these mid-sized or what 
what in global terms are small businesses in New Zealand. I have to laugh because I get a lot of US-based clients on this podcast and they talk about small businesses. But of course, a small business in the US is, you know, 50 to a couple of hundred people. <laughs> yes, and, and millions of dollars of turnover. Yeah, no, totally. Okay. And so tell us a little about your passion for sales. Like why, why are you about sales? What is it that attracts you to that? Oh, look, you know, I'm obviously an extroverted individual, but besides that, I think, you know, I, I like helping people. My innate motivation, my innate drive is to help people. And, you know, when you see organizations in this country struggle with generating revenue or scaling their business, what is it that I can do? Leveraging my experiences, my skills, my gray hair, my scars. And, and that's, that gives me the, the innate satisfaction, the intrinsic value or intrinsic reward that I get is, is to see people flourish. And, you know, coming from the Netherlands, we don't have what we call in this country the tall poppy syndrome. I love seeing entrepreneurs. I love seeing individuals succeed at what they do, right? Because they risk their income, their family, their lives. I love to help them with that. So that, that's really the key core driver. But outside of that, you know, when you're in sales, you're actually there to help customers. You're there to help businesses. In our case, B2B, you help businesses get better at what they do. So, so if you're in a, in a direct sales organization or, or sales function, your job is to help other people. And I want to help those people help other people, if that makes sense. It does make sense. It is interesting. I think we all have a bit of a fear about sales. Sales always feels like that dodgy car salesperson who just, all the people who um, spam you on LinkedIn, all the people who pick up the phone and, and just chill, talk at you. Uh, but that isn't what sales is, is it? Well, not effective sales. <laughs> well, no, correct. But look, that's not going to go away. And yeah, in the 15 years that we've been doing this with Fresh Perspective Sales, I mean, there's a couple of observations I would like to share. The, the number one is that most salespeople in this country do what I call, or forgive the expression, the show up and throw up. So I'm with XYZ and we've got these widgets and we've got this XYZ. Which one do you want to buy? Excuse me, you've not asked me one single question. Or you're doing a show up and throw up. You're not leading to your solution. You're leading with your solution to be more politically correct, right? So instead of saying, showing up and throwing up, you should, you, they're leading with what it is they try to sell instead of leading to. And how do you do that? You ask the right questions. Again, you know, the majority of the salespeople in this country don't know how to ask the right questions of the right people at the right time, or they're too scared. If they come in touch with the CEO or CFO, they shut down or they don't know what to ask at that point in time. And that's where you get the nuggets by asking the right questions at the right time to uncover the need behind the need, et cetera, et cetera. So, so to me, yes, show up and throw up is, is a key, let's say, finding that, we, that we've come across. Greg and I, with Fresh Protect Sales, we would have assessed more than 600 sales individuals, sales managers, sales leaders. That was number one. Number two, and I'm generalizing, forgive me, there are totally exceptions, don't get me wrong, but number two, most of the people in sales are lazy. They are not curious. If you want to be successful in sales, you have to have a curiosity about you, whereby you're curious about the people that you're going to be engaging with, the business that they're in, the environment that they're in. If you don't have that element or that attribute, you're in the wrong job, seriously, because you know, most people don't go the extra mile to find out about the people that they are going to be selling to or communicating with or trying to help. And, you know, the old days, in the old days, when I first had my training at IBM, which was phenomenal, one month in Sydney, it was phenomenal training, don't get me wrong, but in those days, you would ask a question like, what's keeping you awake at night, Deborah? And, you know, this day and age, if anybody asks that question, again, you you're in the wrong job. Why? Because you, you should know already what is keeping them awake. You should know what's going on in their business, what's going on in their life, what is going on in the market. So if you don't know all of those things, you're in the wrong job. You're not going to be successful. You have to spend the time and the effort to find out what's going on in their world, individually, in their job, in their, with their business and in the market. Then you can contribute and add value. That's the other thing. You know? So I said showing and throwing up. So typically they're lazy. They're not curious enough. And then, and then thirdly, you know, if you do not deliver value the minute you open your mouth or the minute you engage and interact, you're wasting your time. And look, the way that people now are buying has changed so much, particularly, of course, during COVID lockdowns. If you do not digitize some of the interactions you have with prospects and with customers, you're going to be left behind. So you have to be on that bandwagon of digitizing a number of the interactions. I'm not saying all of them, and it depends on what, kind of selling you have to do if it's high high value low volume is different than when it's of course high volume low value that could be digitized entirely this day 
I was actually at a conference last week over in Sydney and they were talking about sort of AI chatbots and things. And I mean, they're certainly, they've improved out of sight for a start, but also they're taking away the repetitive stuff, the stuff that is not quite as, doesn't have the, the, as, much, as much value. When you talk about adding value, that's what we do with sales people do. When I first came to New Zealand, it was really interesting. I, I actually had a sales and marketing role for an engineering and construction firm. And part of my role to start off was to go and find out what was actually going on. And we're going out with the salespeople on the road, and I come from a pharmaceutical sales background. So I've had, right. I've had the training. I've had the CRMs back before CRMs were a thing. I've had a laptop back when you used to dial into the little dial-up sort of tone thing when you had this, right? Yeah. And so I, I kind of went to this first sales call, and this, this person went in, and they had a chat about the weather and the rugby, and, and then they came out of the call, and I went, oh, what was the purpose of that call? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, why did you go in and see that customer? Oh, we come and see them once a month, one of our biggest customers. I said, did you have anything you wanted from that call? They're like, no, not really. Oh, okay, interesting. So what's the next steps? We don't really have any. And where have you recorded what you've actually just talked about? Well, we don't record anything. And I just thought, this was a long, long time. So I'm really hoping it's changed since then. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised. And I suppose I, I felt very privileged that I'd actually gone through some serious sales training with modern national pharmaceuticals. But yeah, it's, it is interesting that... The, the needs to, if you're going to add value, you've also got to have a reason for being there as well, right? Absolutely, I agree. And, and you have to be prepared. That, that comes down to that curiosity and be prepared before you go and see somebody. Not just show up with muffins and coffee and talk about the rugby and the weather, forgive me. But to your point, it's still happening today, believe it or not. But so, so that's at a sales individual level from, a, from a observations. But that must come from higher up though too. Like if they're not being held accountable, if they're not sort of... Um, Totally. And that comes down to, you mentioned CRM, for example, you know, you cannot improve what you cannot measure. And some of the things that we do is we put in place functional, the functional implementations of CRM systems, whether that's Salesforce or Microsoft or HubSpot, we've got a customer that uses Insightly CRM, never heard of it, but we're donkey deep into it now. And the point is, if you can't, you know, like I said, if you can't record or, or, or you can't improve what you can't measure. So you have to have ways and means to record certain things during the sales process, for example. That's the kind of stuff that we put in place. But to come back to, you know, I talked about the at individual sales level, that, that individuals are lazy, they show up and they throw up, et cetera. At the sales leader level, you know, the challenge that we find with majority, and again, I'm generalizing in New Zealand, is that sales leaders in this country do not want to have what we call the open, honest, tough, courageous conversations around, sorry, Deborah, you haven't been performing in the last two quarters, you've missed your number. We're going to have to put you on a performance improvement plan. These are the consequences if you don't, et cetera, et cetera. They try to avoid conflict. And, you know, and from my perspective, our perspective, fresh perspective, is that the first job of a sales leader, Deborah, is to get rid of the left hand side of your bell curve. If you think of a bell curve of performance, you've got 60% of your people sitting in the middle, say 20% on the top right hand side, top performing, and 20% on the left hand side. If you do not get rid of and move those people on, guess what happens? The top performing people will go, hang on a minute, I'm working my butt off, I'm getting all the numbers. These people over there are cancerous. They're at the water cooler having all these conversations about what's wrong with this business and what's wrong with their leads, et cetera, et cetera. Excuses, excuses. I'm either going to resign because I don't want to be part of this culture or I'm just going to lower my output. I'm going to work as little as I can because I'm getting away with it. They are getting away with it. So, so they also then take up most of your oxygen as a leader because you think you have to help them. You think you have to coach them. You have to think you have to take them on the journey and get, help them get back. No, you're wasting your time. Because the biggest impact is that impact on your top performing people. If they leave, you have a problem. So your number one, in my view, number one objective as a sales leader is get rid of the left hand side of the bell curve. Secondly, move the middle. If you move 60% of your people 5% to the right, guess what the impact is on, on the business, right? As opposed to try and fix what's on the left. No, move on. Get rid of it. And then it comes down to coaching. And then it comes down to, like I said before, if you can't capture or measure what it is that they're doing, you can't approve it. And that's where, let's say, CRM system comes in. And it's interesting too, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people are, are nervous of CRMs. They see it as being big brother. I used to love my CRM. My CRM made my life entirely easy as a salesperson because it just ran everything for you. Provided you put the next step in it. You woke up in the morning and said, this is what you need to do. <laughs> but from a sales leadership perspective, I must admit when I tried to implement it with one of the sales teams, there was, there was this hesitancy about, well, why, why do we need to record all of that? Why do you need to see all of that? How do you overcome that objection from sales leaders and salespeople? Yeah. 
quite um, yeah no, no no good good question Deborah and, and 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 you're right there's this hesitation by sales individuals as well that they're going to be found out or they're going to be you know, somebody's watching over their shoulder all the time but also sales leaders because sales leaders will be held accountable as well right but the point is this there's two elements to this around CRM implementations and and you know it's quite simply comes down to what we call the carrot and the stick if there's not enough carrots for the individuals concerned or for the sales leaders concerned that enables them to, to be better at their job, to reduce their sales cycle, to you know convert deals quicker. So we're, that's the carrot, you know. If it helps, like you express yourself, it helps you every morning. You know what to do. You know what the focus is. A lot of it's automated in the background. If it doesn't do that. Forget about it, because then it's pure admin, it's pure, you know, satisfying the business and my manager, right? So it's the carrot. But the second one is a stick. So in other words, what we have put in place in a number of businesses around, for example, sales compensation. Is there are gates? We put gates in that says, if your data quality in your CRM says it's not at this level, we're going to withhold your commission until you have updated or it's where it should be, right? Either the entire commission or percentage of commission. Guess what it does? It drives behavior. It drives a wide behavior. And, you know, it's rubbish in, rubbish out. If you do not at the front end put in the right data, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then we create sales processes. We do a lot of sales training. And how do you embed that behavior that you want? Because training is about changing people's behavior, typically, right? How do you embed that? How do you make sure it actually gets done? Because I don't know about you, but we've had so many experiences with external sales training companies whereby they do what we call the one and done. The one and done means they come in, you sit in there for a day, and you get blah with all this information, slide after slide after slide, and you go back to your desk, and then, okay, now what? There's no incorporation of the teachings of the learnings within either the CRM system or within the coaching methodology. We make sure when we deliver sales training, which we do, is that it actually gets embedded and that people know how they can apply it to their job day to day. Otherwise, the one and done's don't work, don't work. So, yeah, so come back to, to the CRM systems. We have helped implement so many different CRM systems, we're agnostic. No matter what the industry, no matter the company is, no matter what, what the organization is, as long as you put things in place that add to those two things, carrot and the stick. It's actually really interesting because, again, going back to my very you know, long, long time ago, back in the pharmaceutical sales, we actually used to have the ability to, once we visited a doctor, we were selling drugs to doctors, you could put in what you had talked about, you could put in a little bit of information, and you could pick a postcard that would then they would be printed off from head office on a dot matrix printer, I think, and they would... Would they get sent to that doctor a day later after you visit them and said, hey, look, you know, great to talk about, blah, 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 blah. Looking forward to catching up and here's where I... And I just thought, you know, that the, it was such a sort of surprise and delight thing because that sort of thing didn't happen, even though it's print on dot matrix printer. It's still something there. And I'm not, I'm not sure that we do that particularly well either. See, I, I used to also use my CRM, not just for keeping track of the doctor's conversations, but I would record the receptionist, what her kids' names were, what their coffee was, what their dog was called, what their interests were. Yeah. And I go in and kind of go, hey, look, Andrew, lovely to see you. I bought you your flat white. And they go, how do you know I have a flat white? And it's like, well, you know, I just remember from last time, my me and my CRM. <laughs> yeah. Totally. But again, it comes back to you. You innately were curious about people. You were interested in people. You would ask them those questions. Most of those people don't. They're there to sell you something. Oh, I've got to hit my quota, my target. I'm, I'm down behind on my target. I have to sell you this. Uh, there's a book, of, a series of books by a guy called Bob Burke called The Go-Giver Series. Have you ever seen those? So he, one of them was just called The Go-Giver. That was his original book. Then he went to Go-Giver Sales. And Go-Giver Sales is all about how you actually give value then and not looking for the sale. The sale actually just happens because you've given value. People want to work with people, right? And trust you as well, yeah. because let's face it, it comes down to trust as well. If you're just here to sell me something like a car salesman, yeah. do you trust them? No, I don't. On the outset. So you, we said it right at the beginning, you talk about the four key pillars. What are the four key pillars of high-performing sales and marketing functions? Good question. So look... Um, We've developed a methodology over these years whereby we would come into an organization, whether they're small, medium, large, doesn't matter, and we do an assessment, an assessment around these four key pillars that we've come to work with. Four key pillars are quite simply following. The number one pillar is what's called strategy, the strategy pillar. What is your overarching business strategy? What is it if you've got one? Because guess what? Some businesses don't. You know for a fact. But some business, so what's your overarching? And then what are the functional strategies? So what is your marketing and what is your sales strategy supporting that overarching business strategy. And guess what? 80%, 90% of the times, either they don't have a business strategy, but let alone let alone a sales and marketing strategy, let alone one that, that actually aligns with the overarching business strategy. Because like I said to you before, 
things have changed dramatically out there after COVID, right? Businesses had to change the way that they would go to market or where they were selling and how they were selling. Guess what? A lot of the functional strategies, such as sales and marketing, haven't changed. This is how we've always sold. Why should we change? This, this is how we've always engaged. And we're different. Well, I don't know about you. We get it. We're di but we're different. Oh, hang on a minute. You're in this business, aren't you? Yes. Okay. So the four key pillars apply. Strategy number one. If you don't have an aligned sales and marketing strategy to your arching business, you're not rowing in the same direction. You're going in the wrong direction. You're not going to get the results you deserve and, and, and that you require. That's number one. And I wouldn't mind, Ben, there's a lot of businesses that have not got a sales and marketing strategy. They might have a business strategy or a business plan, but they haven't actually thought about how that aligns. Because I see that with some of my clients as well as like they have a sales plan. Like, so how do you... Uh, yeah, you you just anyway, use your yeah. shotgun. Use your shotgun. I'll throw some mud on the wall and hope that something sticks. You can't afford that anymore these days. You have to be laser focused. Anyway, that's the number one. Number two is funny that the customer pillar, which is all about. So who are your customers? What is your segmentation that you do? If you think of a pyramid with your A accounts, B accounts, C, what's your strategic account planning process and methodology? Have you got one? Again, most people don't, right? Well, what does that mean? It means understanding who's who in the zoo, forget the expression, at that account level. But what market are they in? What are their challenges? What are the needs that they've got? And document that on an ongoing basis within your CRM system, not in a Word document that ends up in a drawer somewhere, right? No, it is live all the time. So that's the customer pillar. And then the third pillar is the people in the functions. So, and that's about competencies. So for example, we developed a competency model that says if you are an individual sales contributor in this industry or in this type of role, be it a BDM or forgive the expression, hunter versus farmer, what are the typical competencies and attributes and experiences that you would look for in an individual when you hire them or when, you, when they're on board? You know, we've, like I said, we've assessed more than 600 people. We would do an assessment against those competencies and that then helps you create a development plan. So let's say if, if one of the individuals is not that great at or needs help with negotiation, well, there, there's a development plan you could then create for that individual or for teams. And we've done this for multi-country businesses. So you have an aggregated development plan if a lot of people need negotiation skills, well, there's there's an opportunity to put a course together, et cetera, so, or coaching together. So it's a, so the people is around hiring, hiring processes. Because again, you ask businesses, what's your hiring process? What do you mean? Well, we put an ad in LinkedIn and, and then we have a couple of interviews and it's all ad hoc and, okay, have you considered doing this and this? Oh, I never thought of it. What a great idea. So we help formulate those hiring processes as well. Anyway, it's the hiring, the firing, it's the, training, development, anything to do with people. Compensation sits in the fourth pillar, sales compensation. We call it the sales enablement pillar, Deborah, by that contains sales processes, CRM systems, or any systems for that matter. What is the, are the sales enablement tools and processes that you have in place, if any? Those four key pillars add up to about 20 elements, individual elements that sit in those, in those four key pillars. And what we then typically do, we assess of those 20 elements, number one, which of those are important to your business today and going forward? Because not all of them are relevant depending on the industry. If you're in a in New Zealand versus the Sun Across Healthcare versus the Fairfax Media, they vary, the importance of them. Then the ones that are important that we've identified are important to you as an organization today and going forward, which ones do you not have or are underdeveloped or need to be further developed? It gives you a heat map, quadrants. Think about right up a corner, there's four or five elements out of the 20 that need to be further developed or put in place full stop. So. That's the first step we do. Second step is, okay, now we've identified collectively what it is that's missing or what needs to be developed. What are we going to do about it? To me, it's all about action, right? It's nice to have a white paper around what, needs, what has been identified. What are you going to do about it? So that's a strategy session that we have with the executive of an organization. And then we decide who's going to do what by when, et cetera. So we're with a governance plan around it. Third phase is execution. And most of the cases, most cases, companies say, we've got day jobs we're busy selling or busy whatever, can you help us implement it? And we do. We come in and we become part of the team. And it's fascinating because we've got so many testimonials of people. For example, there's a relatively well-known director called Wayne Norrie, who was Ice House, who had various companies. He said the difference between what Fresh Perspective Sales does and what I've experienced with other consultants is this. Consultants typically stand at the top of the hole and shout down and tell me what to do, right? You guys jumped in the hole with me and helped me climb out the hole. You're together on the ladder. You created the ladder. You helped me climb out. Phenomenal. Another testimonial was, okay, 
you guys don't just stand on the sideline and shout that the player's on the pitch. You're actually part of, you're in the ruck, rugby expression. You're part of the ruck. You're underneath. You, you, you're dirty. Well, great. We love those kind of you know, testimonials. And that's what we do. We become part of the team. I want to go back a little bit because I heard you use the whole hunter, hunter versus farmer with a little bit tongue in cheek, I think. But I mean, is that still true that there are two different types of salespeople? As in a hunter who goes out and looks for the business and then a farmer who is more about account managing and keeping that person kind of happy and making sure that they're, they're growing. Um, yes, there is. And, 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 and the attributes or the competencies are different. And, and good luck if you can find somebody who can do both. It's very hard to find somebody who is, let's say, self-motivated, gets out of bed thinking, I'm going to target, I'm going to find new customers because that, again, requires certain thick skin. Hardwired into you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The hunting aspect of, and, and then finding, so identifying, finding, closing opportunities, closing new class, new customers, new, new clients is not something that everybody and anybody can do. Typically account managers or farmers, forgive the expression, they are, you know, more on the, on the post-sale side, whereby they're, they're, they're responsible for customer success or they're responsible for identifying for additional opportunities within an existing customer, not finding net new logos. There's, still that difference. And can that second function be outsourced? Because I heard you talking about people who've got outsourced teams. I know there's a, a big trend towards taking away some of that work and using more cost-effective teams, shall we say. Yeah, so, so it's not so much, I don't think, on the account management side, because once you've got a customer on board, you want to retain that relationship and, and be present in that organization rather than outsource that function. There's a lot of people that are now outsourcing the BDM, the business development side of things. So cold calling, setting up appointments. So, so let's say you've got an account manager or you've got a sales individual, you can outsource or people outsource getting appointments. Get me an appointment. These are the typical industries, companies that you need to target, start calling, start calling. Now, how effective that is this day and age, I'm not necessarily convinced. Why? Because that's a numbers game. And it's typically the challenge I have is that a lot of people compensate those kind of companies on the number of calls they make, the number of appointments that they make, but they're not qualified. Oh, you want me to just get your appointments? How many do you want? Here's 50. Okay. Are they, what value are they? Have they been qualified? No, they haven't. So, so, so to me, that, that's throwing money uh, away or season through the rocks. So yes, you can, you can outsource some of that. And now with AI as well, you've got the ability to have make full cold calls through AI. Well, again, where's the personal touch? Where's the value? But I think there's also a real danger, and I've just seen it just recently, is that, I mean, I'm all for using automation, and I do believe if we can get rid of, if we can get rid of certain things, it makes a lot of sense. And even some of, the, some of the messages I've seen come through are quite beautiful, except for the fact they've sent it to me and I'm already a customer. And so you kind of go, okay, <laughs> there's a fundamental flaw there, isn't there? So I remember reading one actually just this morning and I kind of read it and went, oh, this sounds really interesting. And, it, and then I realized, oh my goodness, they're trying to sell me something. And yet I'm already got a, you know, I'm already a customer of this. So that comes down to CRM and having, and, and having it integrated within our workflow automation and stuff. Totally as well. personalizing because that's to me, like I said to you before, the way that B2B buyers are buying this day and age, especially with millennials coming through as well. They've done their research. They're 78% through their buying journey before they pick up the phone or reach out to somebody, if they reach out at all. They've, they've narrowed it down. Think about the last time you bought something for yourself. You've done your homework in terms of Google search, et cetera, et cetera. Then you go and you know, touch, feel, whatever, have a conversation. But same in B2B, with B2B buying. On top of that, B2B buyers expect now a B2C buying experience. And what I mean by that is that think of Netflix. Think, I don't know whether you use Kindle or use Kindle Art or Amazon or Alibaba. It doesn't matter. You know, when you, when you search for something, you buy something, guess what happens? They say, oh, people that bought this, bought this as well. Netflix this day and age. Talk about AI, right? If you like, for example, George Clooney as an actor, right? And who doesn't, right? Anyway, my <laughs> wife does. That's okay. But if you, through social media or, and it gets picked up, as you know, you talk today about going to Montenegro, guess what? Bro, you get advertisers, advertise, advertisements for Montenegro. Anyway, detail. Point is, Netflix now, through the algorithm algorithms, if you like George Clooney and there's a movie coming up with George Clooney, the trailer, the trailer for that movie, guess what we'll have? George Clooney in it. I like Robert De Niro. If they're on the same movie, guess the trailer that I'm going to watch is Robert De Niro instead of George Clooney, etc. So, So my point is it has to be personalized. And the B2B buyers these days expect that experience when they are willing and in the market to buying something from a B2B perspective. Big change.
And, and so, for example, one implication of that is that if you think again of the pyramid, your A, B, C, and D customers, not all C and D customers. You need to put an expensive outbound in-person sales rep on. You can, you can digitize that whole journey. And again, businesses in this country are not thinking along those lines. Oh, no, no, well, we have to, we have to meet face-to-face, -face, but they're buying 100 bucks a week. Well, you can't afford it. Oh, no, no, but this is how we've always done it, and we're different. Yeah, okay, good luck. See you later. I want to switch completely now. So we've got strategy, customer, people, and the compensation and sales enablement. I'm interested in the whole compensation side because there is, and maybe it's just me, but I've seen in New Zealand that most salespeople expect like a really big base salary and then they want compensation or commission on top of that, which is fine. Well, is it? I don't know. Maybe it's fine. <laughs> yeah, that depends, definitely. But, you know, is, is there any kind of research or anything that you've seen that shows that actually having a less salary or bigger salary makes a difference, having a, an accelerated sales commission program versus a traditional sales. What, what, what's the trends or the above? How long is a piece of string? Yeah, Yeah, but again, we've got so many different examples and experiences now of how we put together collaboratively sales compensation plans or we call a raw architecture, an architecture whereby depending on the, on the behavior you want to drive within your sales function, so like coming back to if you have business development managers versus farmers versus account managers, typically a business development individual has got a higher risk, higher component of their total pay at risk. Could be 50-50. In, in one example, we get a 100% commission. Guess what? That drives behavior, trust me. Because the, the bigger you make your base pay, people get comfortable. And like I said to you before, I'm generalizing, majority of the people in this country are what? Lazy. Why? Because it pays the mortgage and commission is seen as cream on top. So... No. So, so again, we establish with those businesses, what is the behavior that you want to drive? How can you compensate for that? And, and, and there's many different ways. We call them plan types. You could be on plan type that says 50% base, 50% commission, or 80-20, 80% base, 20% commission. It's, it's up to what the business... So it should be driven by what outcomes you want to get from that. Um, and I suppose also the amount of the value of the products and services you're selling as well. Yeah. Totally, because let's say if you've got long sales cycles, right, if it's six months, 12 months, and they have to wait for that long before they can earn commission, different conversation. But there's another element that we typically put on the table. So it's not just around what are your targets, what do you need to achieve, but also we call them specific sales objectives. So for example, if you have a new salesperson starting first few months, they're not necessarily going to sell much, right? So we've got specific sales objectives that they need to achieve within that period of time for them to get their commission paid, full stop. So guaranteed commission, but not, but guaranteed only on the basis of achieving certain KPIs. Yeah, absolutely. Specific sales objectives here. Yeah. Like you have to call on these 10 customers or, or I then do, et cetera, whatever that looks like. So yeah. Okay. And all about profitability, because profitability often sits in the hands of the salespeople. And yet, I, and again, a mass generalization and I'm going to get shot by all the Kiwis out there. But I do feel like the whole pricing thing is, um, it seems to, and I, I've talked, shared with you a bit myself, I've done it myself, where people kind of question the price and the quickest and easiest thing to do is drop the price, which means it drops profitability. Yes, so, totally. Yeah. And, and look, and that comes down, in my view, again, to the laziness of salespeople because they think, oh, I have to drop my price because otherwise we're going to lose the business. Hang on a minute. What are you going to get in return? So we, we, we teach, we train people on negotiation. So when it comes to that conversation whereby, okay, so you want me to drop, what do you want me to take out then? Uh, we've got this, is, is, this is the... The quote with all these elements, these these aspects. Tell me which ones you want to take out. I'm happy to reduce the price, but which ones do you? Yeah. Well, oh no, no, no. We need to hold back it, etc. Okay. Well, great. What am I going to get? And this is not what you would ask the customer, but in your mind you go, if I have to do something for that particular prospect or that customer, what am I going to get in return? So, I've made the same mistake right in my early days at IBM. RFP responses. We got RFPs coming up the wazoo. You're going to come out of our ears working until 4 a.m. in the morning to get an RFP response done, a document this thick. And, and, and the point was, we never, never got involved with putting the RFP together. We didn't have the right relationship. We didn't win any. Guess, guess why? Because that was the learning, the big scars that I've got, is that whenever somebody asks you to do something, a customer, a prospect, what are you going to get in return? Happy to, do, happy to respond to the RFP, but before we do so, I need to have a meeting to understand and, get, and ask you some questions because I want to make sure that whatever I put in the RFP an example, meet your needs or is it required? Oh, it's in the document. I still have a, lo a lot of large number of questions. Oh, we don't, we, no, we, we're not going to, uh, okay, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to respond to the RFP. Simple as that. Simple as that. And they said, well, but you have to. Well, why? If you can't commit to some time, I need 30 minutes of your time and you can't commit to that, sorry, 
oh, but you have to. Well, why is that? You're just doing a price check, et cetera, et cetera. So you peel the layers to get to really the core of why do they need a price reduction? And look, and there comes a point where you walk away as well, right? Well, there's an opportunity cost. We talked about this too. It's like at the end of the day, particularly if you're selling time, then there is an opportunity cost for you taking something like that, that price versus something else. But even, but even in any business, whether it's services, whether it's a product, there, it's still always going to come with some loss of profitability. So there has to be something in return, right? Totally, totally. But look, and then coming back to sales conversation, there's a lot of companies that say, oh, we want to pay people on gross margin. We want to pay them commission on the gross margin. And, and, and in principle, that makes sense, right? Hey, uh, we, could, we say revenue is vanity, cash is sanity, or profit is sanity, right? So, uh, but a lot of businesses can't measure gross margin. They cannot measure it. If it's a services, they can't actually measure it. So what, you deem it then? We've got companies that deemed the margin, and that, was, that didn't work out either because sales reps would then... Um, question the validity of the sales compensation and would go, hang on, it doesn't look right. And they spend time wheel spinning, internal navel gazing, waste of time. So if you can measure profitability, it can be part of the equation, but it's not all of the equation either, right? And I'm interested in leading and lagging indicators. So we obviously teach a lot of our clients about measurables and we always say within your measurables and your scorecard, you should have leading and lagging indicators. There is an element of, you know, quantity into the funnel is going to have an, an ultimate thing, but it's really more about conversion that makes a difference, isn't it? Because you can keep pumping things into the funnel, but if they're not converting, it's a waste of everybody's time and effort. That's right. So leading and lagging in that, in that, in that aspect, in that context, is you now when we help people do the functional implementation of CRM systems, for example, we create dashboards. And you know, you've got leading indicators. For example, you're saying that you, you're saying in your pipeline that in the next 30 days, you're going to close these 15 opportunities, but they're still sitting in the prospecting stage. Your sales cycle typically is six months. So you're kidding yourself and you're kidding us by saying you're going to close these 15 opportunities in the next 30 days, and they're still sitting in prospecting the top of the funnel while your sales cycle is six months. This is wrong, right? Or we have your pipeline says you've got, say, 65 opportunities in total. Of those 65, you've got 15 with the close date in the past. They're stale. We call them stale. Or we say, in your pipeline, you've got multiple sales stages, right? From prospecting to negotiation to contract signed, et cetera. These opportunities have been in this sales stage for more than 90 days. What are you doing about it? Right? So to your point, lay leading and lagging, right? It's, those are leading indicators. Or what's the shape of your pipeline like? And it's fascinating. You know, in one case, we indicated to a business owner, you look at the shape of the pipeline of this individual, it's very bottom heavy. So if you think of a pipeline in this V shape, it was a lot sitting at the bottom, nothing at the top. So we said to that individual, the business owner, watch this person, he's looking for another job. And he was, because he was not putting anything in the top of the funnel, it was all the bottom mm -hmm. to get commission, basically. Anyway, it's fascinating. Uh, but that's the point around measuring. If you want to improve things, you have to be able to measure it. Perfect. Hey, look, I'm sure there's lots we could talk about. But so we've covered the, the four key pillars, the strategy, customer, people, conversation, sales enablement. It, it, this, these things actually apply whether you've got one salesperson and maybe you're the salesperson of your organization, or if you've got a whole team of salespeople, the same things still apply, don't they? They're, they're, they're principles, yeah. Just in terms of for the listeners, we always love to give them some top tips and tools that they can take away so they can go, oh, I can do something about that right now. What would be your three kind of top tips you'd share with the listeners? Number one, when you think about your sales and marketing function, hire slow, fire fast. So what I mean by that is that we've had so many examples whereby people employed individuals because they needed people. I've done, I've made the same mistake. I needed somebody in Christchurch. I had to travel down, blah, blah, blah. The, not to quite, but almost the first person walking through the door got the job. Six months later, I had to move them on because they're the wrong person. So make sure you got the right person. Other examples of customers whereby they've promoted sales individuals into sales leadership roles. They didn't have those competencies or skill sets. They were an individual contributor. And then six months later, they have to say to them, sorry, it's the wrong appointment. Guess what? Ego gets in the way. They resign or walk off. Major loss to a business. So that highest life and fire fast is, yeah, is, but it applies to internal promotions as well, right? So don't just promote your top salesperson. Just Make because sure you've got a hard you. beat means that you can do the job, right? I mean, and, and tell me examples of that. So that's number one. And we talked earlier in the, in the podcast about getting rid of the 20% on the left-hand side of the bell curve as well. So that's firing fast, right? But they're not performing. 
keep elevating the performance of the total sales and marketing function. By doing that, every year you should look at who's on the, top, who's on the left hand side of the bell because what are we doing about it? Moving on and setting the example to the top performer that this is a high performing culture. You want to stay in this business, you have to perform in detail. Number one, higher, slow, fire, fast. Number two, like I said, you know, you cannot improve what you cannot measure. So make sure that whatever you want people to do from a behavior perspective, you can measure that and report on it and hold people accountable against it from a coaching perspective, from a learning and development perspective, like, and that could be CRM, it could be whatever that looks like. That's the other one. So once you've identified what some of the development areas are within your sales and marketing function in terms of individuals, teams, et cetera, make sure you don't just put a one and done training exercise in place because they don't work. We've, we've had situations whereby people would come in from around the world into New Zealand for a week, a week's long training, very expensive, of course, and we would ask the, in this case, the company that provided the training. So what are you going to put in place to make sure that when they go back to their countries and to their desks in New Zealand, that they actually apply what you've been teaching them? That's not our job. That's what they would tell us. And we go, really? And you, you're charging them how much for this training? So in other words, you know, sales training, please don't do the one and dones. Make sure that whatever you put in place actually gets embedded and we can help with that as well. We do the training, but we also make sure that whatever we teach them to be measured is going to be embedded because you need to change their behavior. Practical and pragmatic and yeah, making sure you're actually from just the, because I think we, this is one of the things I loved it when I first started doing EOS. You know, a lot of coaching people will come in and they'll do this beautiful plan and we get all oh, people to get very excited about the vision, the values and blah, blah, blah. But then they go back into the business and nothing has changed. And so that plan very quickly gets shelved somewhere. Nothing happens with it. Whereas if you actually change the fundamental behaviors and start putting things in place, you'll get the long-term results from the plan that you put up later. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Well, we're going to put details of where they can get in contact with you in the podcast notes. Just in terms of a last thing you'd like to finish up on and share with the listeners? Oh, look, you know, <laughs> uh, who, need, who doesn't need sales and, and or marketing for that matter? Because... From our perspective, marketing and sales now are so much more coupled and intertwined, more so than ever before. Why? Because of this digitization of the buying journey of people out in B2B land, whereby it's not just siloed, and we still see too many silos in companies and businesses, whereby marketing is a separate department, sales is separate, they're one. Well, I, I take it one step further. When I was working at Tower, I was head of the sales and marketing, I'm sorry, the yeah, head of sales and marketing at Tower, was that they, sorry, head of marketing, sorry, they had a head of sales, they had a head of customer service, and then we had marketing. And when I first went there, those three departments didn't talk to each other. Now, sales, marketing, and customer service in an insurance industry is all one and the same. It's all part of that kind of customer journey. I was always fascinated by that. So, But I think you're right with the way that people are behaving online now and the amount of work they're doing around the traditional kind of marketing thing before they even become a sales prospect. You've got to have those two working very closely together. Yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, if you want to have some help with your sales and marketing fresh perspective, <laughs> then certainly get in contact with Andrew. Um, thank you so much for coming along sharing. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure. It was great. Absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah.